This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I don't think there's a person in the city who knows more facts and stories about it than Justin Ferrati. He is an urban, social, and architectural historian and New York's most illustrious tour guide, and he's my guest today. So welcome, Justin. I'm so glad to have you. Oh, uh, thank you. Now, when you were a boy, first of all, where did you live, and what did you think you were going to do with your life? Would just have adventures? Um, well, I actually grew up in Washington State on what was then called a stump farm. Um, and for those who've never heard of a stump farm, that's property that's so poor that the only thing it's good for growing are tree stumps. Oh. Um, <laughs> and my parents had gone off to Alaska to homestead during the Depression, ran out of money in Washington State, and that's where we I was raised, where my brothers and sisters were raised. So what I wanted to do when I grew up, I I really wasn't sure. Um, I sort of liked the world, so. So you landed up in something that is really liking everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, people often say, you know, are you a teacher? And of course I am. Yeah. Um, and my background is education, but I say what I've discovered is I have the best classroom in the world because I have the city. So where did you get the idea, though, of being, of, of Love, of finding out what all the neighborhoods were, of looking at the history of buildings, and of really then showing it to other people. How did that idea come about? It's funny because I'd love to say that there was this genesis and yeah. this progression, but there's some things in life you just do and you don't think about. It. I've always given tours wherever I lived, um, even as I was a teenager when I lived in Ohio. I, um, many years later, moved back to Washington State and I became uh, noted for the programs I was doing about a local architect named Kirtland Cutter. Um, and it was just, it was, I loved my subject and I liked to share. Your, and your parents sound as if they were adventurous. adventurous. Mm, no? You know, it's interesting. So did it, did it, it's, I'm always interested in how people become what they are. I, There's no explanation sometimes, except from the inner soul. Well. I think, I have to admit, when, when we think about, I think any of us think about our parents, and we think about if we were to sort of write out a history of what our parents did, most of us would be amazed. Yeah. I mean, I certainly am amazed. My parents basically left Cleveland, Ohio, decided to homestead simply because it was the only affordable thing to do. They traveled across the country, you know, with nothing. When my sister was born, she traveled in a, in a, in a dresser drawer. <laughs> across the country. They created a whole world, a whole life. Not because I think of any conscious, mm. it was just moving forward. Mm. And, and that to me is amazing. But my parents were city folk. I grew up in the country and I never quite understood the city country thing until I moved to the city. Um, and then ironically, in terms of New York, I moved to New York City uh, more by accident than by intent. And, uh, and I didn't like it. And when did you start to like it? Interesting story. It's more um, than start to like because you fell in love with it. I fell in love with yeah. it. Yeah. I'd always given tours. Um, I was in a bookstore, which is not a surprising mm -hmm. thing for me. And uh, I found a book called New York, A Guide to the Metropolis by a fellow named Gerard Wolfe. Uh, I, I have a funny, funny habit, um, or interesting habit, curious habit. When I read a book by someone where I like the book, I try to write a thank you letter. Isn't that a nice habit? Well, I always, I always feel that, that anyone who writes a book will always get the letters about on page 36 you made a really oh, egregious mistake. Absolutely, don't you love that? 
And yet, when we read a book we like, we maybe tell a friend, but it doesn't go any further. And I keep thinking, for all of the energy, all of the attention, all of the time it takes to create a book, a thank you sometimes is a nice thought. It's a lovely thing. So in this case, um, it said that the author was a, an instructor at New York University. So I telephoned him and I said, hi, you don't know me, but I've never met another tour guide before. And, um, and I'm really impressed by your book. And he said, well, I'm doing a tour this weekend. Would you like to join me? And that was the beginning of my love affair for New And that's York. Wolf Tours then. You have a... I, Gerard Wolf eventually left New York City, uh -huh. but he had created, when he was at NYU, he created a walking tour program. And so uh, the people asked me if I would take over the program. And, and ironically, I've been conducting tours for the Wolf Walkers longer than Gerard Wolf did. <laughs> but um, I learned that because you have a website, which we'll come back to. Right. But so you fell in love with, with, with New York. And, Absolutely. And, and it, in a, in a way, you wanted to know more about how these things came about, I guess, because you're so wonderful about the histories of places. Well, I love the histories of places, and what I love about New York is simply just the, the chaos of it all. Um, I love living in a city where people don't agree with me, <laughs> and that's fine, and that's the rule of the game. Right? Where not everyone thinks the same way, where there are different ways of approaching the same things in life and yet having a totally different attitude. I learn from others and hopefully others learn from me. And for me, this constant back and forth, and it, yes, it's chaotic, yes, sometimes it's almost, almost anarchistic, and yet there's a wonderful human joy about that that I find so great. I mean, the city of New York is about people, bottom line. And, uh, and the people who made it, I guess. And the people who or made who it, make and it. the people, people who make continue it. to make yeah. it. So and that's, that's <laughs> for me, you know, one of the things that's always interesting is I'll do a lot of research and finding out how a neighborhood came about or what was involved, who were the major players when things were developed. And yet, as I go through, if I could leave the neighborhood for two months, I'll come back and I'll find it's a different neighborhood. Something has changed. Any New Yorker knows that. You leave town for yeah. a few months and suddenly you don't recognize your own neighborhood. Or a new building is up. New building shop. just popped up. I know this is going to be a very hard question for you to answer, but do you have a favorite neighborhood? I hate to say it, but somebody else has beat you to the punch on that question. <laughs> I get asked that question a lot, and, yeah. I, and, and I have to say, it's like asking a parent which of your Child. children is right. your favorite. So let's t describe one of them, one of the favorites, which illustrates what you're saying in, in, that, in a kind of the history and the current stuff. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sense. Uh, I, I find Harlem as a neighborhood fascinating, but I will do different perceptions of Harlem. So uh, sometimes I will focus on the Dutch and early English history of Harlem. Um, uh, I've created programs where I have focused on the, um, the Central and Western European section of Harlem on the east side when Harlem was Scandinavian and Irish and, and German. Um, and then later Romanian and Russian, and then also when it would become Cuban and Puerto Rican and, and Italian and the relationship of those communities. Um, one of the programs I've developed recently that people have been very responsive to um, uh, is looking at different aspects of Jewish Harlem because most people do not know that Harlem used to be the third largest Jewish community on the planet Earth. and. Um, my grandmother lived, or my mother, I'm not quite sure, there's that beautiful big house near a fork. I'm forgetting, it's, uh, it, well, I'll have to do more research. At the top of Harlem? A no, a, in house. about the 120s or 118, no, below 116th Street, below. Below 116th It's the Graham, was it, or something like that? The, the uh, well, we'll come back. Uh, when you come back on this Graham program, apartments? I think maybe, is that a big building? It was built by uh, Colonel John Jacob Astor IV. It's a it's sister a building for those who know the Apthorpe oh, apartments sure. on the it's upper 79th west side. 79th Street and Broadway. It, on 79th and Broadway. It's a sister exactly. building. Exactly, that's the building. Uh, Colonel John Jacob Astor IV built much of the upper west side and he built much of Harlem. And in fact, Brooke Astor 
one of her <laughs> final gifts to the city of New York is that there are these lovely little suburban houses on 130th Street. And I'm using suburb correct, right. uh, correctly, <laughs> word incorrectly, correct. <laughs> anyway, but um, you know, I always say a suburb by definition is within the city limits and it's all of the country and the city in the same location. And there are these lovely little brick houses with little wooden front porches up on 130th Street. And she would restore them as a, an homage, if you would, to Colonel mm -hmm. John Jacob Astor IV, my favorite person to live <laughs> in the Graham Court Apartments was, yeah. was, uh, was a... Zora Neale Hurston. Oh, and did she write favorite, there? Favorite she wrote writer. there? She wrote there, she yeah. lived there. What do, you, wh what do you define as Harlem? What's the area? It's like every New York yeah. neighborhood. I would say every boundary in New York City depends on the person you're talking to. But for, it depends on the issues. Remember, historically, Harlem started on the east side at 74th Street. Oh. And then made a diagonal up to 104th Street on the west side. So, which explains why Gracie Mansion, for example, is a Harlem summer house. Uh -huh. And but for because of the superimposing of the grid plan, 96th Street for most people is sort of the dividing line, sort of the mm -hmm. practical. It becomes East Harlem also on the east side now, doesn't east it? East Harlem. I noticed in the taxi cabs when they used to, they have maps. They show East Harlem as 96th Street and above from the from Central Park to the East River. It's, funny. Well, it's, it's always interesting. I find maps interesting. Yeah. I find definitions interesting. One of my bad jokes is that there used to be a place called Spanish Harlem, <laughs> but it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and, and people look puzzled and say, no, but there is a neighborhood called Spaha. <laughs> and it's now being yeah. promoted as, as a, a, as a trendy, move. chic neighborhood. Which is a shame, isn't it, in a way? Do you approve of the gentrification of neighborhoods or not? Um, how do I say I'm not the moral yeah. center of the universe? I can't change it. Are there losses? There are tremendous losses. Um, do people lose out? People lose out. People win. I mean, yeah. it's a plus it's and It's part minus. of the moving and changing that you part love the about the city. Part of the moving and changing. I mean, yeah. New York City is sort of, I would say, it's like changing all the, the coins in your pocket from but one But critics to say we're, we're, we're losing the poor population from the city because they're being priced out of the city more and more moving I, out of the city. Yeah, definitely is definitely true. I mean, it's interesting to me to look at neighborhoods like Williamsburg, which were, you know, basically largely to a certain extent almost desolate a few years mm -hmm. ago. Then because of the young kids who would be idolized in the Broadway show Rent, uh, were forced out of the East Village because they couldn't afford the rent. They hopped on the subway and took one stop into Brooklyn and then transformed that neighborhood. I always remember Ed Koch's line, the role of an artist is to make a neighborhood so desirable that the artist can no longer afford to live there. And what I find more frightening is that that is not only in a sense sort of a joke, but it's become the public development policy mm -hmm. of many cities across the United States. And if you look up the Hudson Valley, look how many cities are wooing the artists mm -hmm. to come with the sole purpose of raising the real estate values. And so then they the can artists. move them out. It, let's go back to Harlem. There w that was the site of the Battle of Harlem Heights, wasn't it? I mean, it played a, a role in the Revolutionary Very War. Very important role. Uh, and in, then Harlem Heights, is where Columbia University is located. Right. And it's always interesting to connect that between uh, the Battle of Brooklyn, Murray Hill, where at least according to legend, Mary Murray lived, who had been one of the number of women that George, uh, George Washington had uh, at least uh, shown attention to. Um, and then ultimately ending up at uh, the Morris Jumel Mansion, which is a building many New Yorkers know, but many New Yorkers don't know. And uh, it is the oldest uh, single family house in Manhattan today. It's really quite wonderful. Yeah. What is the, I'm, I'm sure you've been asked this question also, tell us about one of the most obscure, interesting places or, or historic sites or buildings that you like to show. Most obscure, <laughs> hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm going to, veer the question Change in a different yeah. way. There was a program that I had tried to promote for a number of years that um, I would get no one to pick up on. And finally, um, I did a program with uh, Susan Linder who'd worked with the New York Public Library. And the focus of the tour is Secrets of New York. Mm. 
And uh, Susan did something rather funny. She gave out the official itinerary, which was a sheet of New York Public Library stationer with the phrase, top secret stamp across <laughs> it. So, um, but the purpose of the tour was not necessarily one thing, but to focus on the little things. Mm -hmm. Because to me, what makes New York rich is often the little things, not necessarily the big thing. We all know the major landmarks, but you know, things like, um, I love Strauss Park, for example, on the Upper West Side, dedicated to Street, isn't it? Ida and Isidore Strauss at 106th Street and Broadway. And it's right across the street from where their summer house used to be. And here's a monument to that remarkable couple that, that died on the Titanic. It's a very loving memorial done by friends and neighbors. And it has many layers as you look through it. It's one of, and I think, one of the most beautiful memorials in the city. Um, it it uh, explains who the Strausses were as German Jews in an American world, and what did that translate, not only in terms of how they lived their life, but also how their death was memorialized. There's nothing very obviously Jewish about the memorial, and yet everything about the memorial is Jewish. And so it's interesting for me to be able to have these conversations with people. Mm -hmm. Another memorial that I absolutely love is what I think is the finest World Trade Center Memorial in New York City, and that's in Staten Island, and something that many New Yorkers don't even know about. And I always say, this is a great trip. Take that free ride on the Staten Island Ferry. You have to get off anyway. Walk out to Bay Street, make a right to the end of the Staten Island Yankee Stadium. You've walked maybe four minutes. Make a right turn and follow the ramps and the stairs to postcards which is this majestic memorial based on two postcards caught in the wind, like postcards you send to your oh. friends. Have, have you seen no, the memorial? No, no. Inside, it's done by a Japanese-American artist, uh, an artist architect named Masayuki Sono, who goes by the nickname Masa. And um, he created these two wonderful white postcards focused and this was for a number of years the painful part at an empty site where the World Trade Center was. Most people don't know more people from Staten Island died in the World Trade Center disasters than from anywhere else. So this was done by an international competition by the borough president okay. and Masuki Sono won. Inside, once you walk down, if you come down the ramp and stairs, it's like drum rolls. Right. And you start, it's like walking down the aisle to get married or walking down the aisle to graduation and you enter into the postcards and realize you're in a shrine and on the walls and panels nine inches by 11 inches the numbers very important are the profiles of all the people from staten island who died the profiles were done with the family members assistance so every family member who wanted to participate could be part of that it's majestic and, no, and people don't know about it. People don't know about it. You know, every September 11th when the sun rises, it shines through the stone. It's travertine marble. shines through the stone. And the faces of the congregation light up. Mm. And I do a lot of work with memorials because I, I like memorials. I find them interesting. Many memorials people will go to once. Yeah. This memorial, I have seen people who have come back repeatedly. It's a very special place because for those people who lost someone, it really is a place where they can come back and, and, and make special friends. And not have throngs around them. And not have throngs, but more importantly, it's, it's a way of connecting. You can actually, it's yours. It's, it's, it's a very haunting site. So now, what about a cheery place? Cheery place. Well, wow, lots of cheery. Well, actually, that, that, it's inspiring. I, I don't. That, that's not a gloom and doom. No, I know. I know. I didn't. But uh, cheery place. Well, let's, cheery place. Actually, I'm going to change neighborhoods. Neighborhoods. De neighborhoods had tended to be segregated by what? Race, religion, Economic, economics. You know. Is there a change in that? Well, that could go in different directions. It's certainly in Manhattan, money is more and more and more defining the city, and I find, uh, or defining the island. And, and I find, in terms of that, you're losing out more and more on the the ethnicities mm. and the, the special the, flavor the, of the, the flavors that are you know given to to the city by that 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 almost cacophony of of of, of 
tastes and people and sounds and languages and all of that. Um, uh, this is me curmudgeon me, but I, I, I regret the introduction of the big box store. I, people are amazed when I say when I moved to New York, there were no McDonald's and there were no Starbucks. Right. And wasn't the world wonderful? And you had little, you had little different stores. They were different more interesting stores and, and everything. Everything is in, and all of that is largely gone. And, and, and I'll tell you a story. I like stories. I was doing a tour of East Harlem, and it was with my class. I have often taught tour guides over the years, and I had a little sort of microphone I was carrying with me. And um, this was before uh, the major section of East Harlem would be demolished a few years mm -hmm. ago. And uh, so I was going through the neighborhood. We're talking with, and I've got my students who are basically New Yorkers, and these young kids are bicycling around. And um, uh, the young black and Puerto Rican kids who live in the neighborhood, and they say, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're doing a tour of the neighborhood. And they said, oh, well, well what do you want to say? Well, you know, why don't we interview you? Let's, let's ask you some questions. And so they really loved this. So I took out yeah, the little yeah. microphone, and they got <laughs> to speak on the microphone. I said, well, what do you think about the the proposal to demolish these buildings and to, to build a, a new shopping mall complex. And the kids said, we hate it. And they said, and I said, and, and, and why do you hate it? And they said, see those houses? Those are where the old Italian people live. They're like our grandparents. They watch out for us. They take care of us. And, and you know what? We like bicycling in the neighborhood. We like walking in the neighborhood. We like crossing the street. And you know, when it becomes a shopping mall, no one's going to notice the kids. And you know, there are going to be accidents and people are going to get hurt. And, and the world would be different then. And we mm. don't like that. Mm. And I was thinking to myself, out of the mouth of babe, mm, yeah, because everything they said absolutely became true. But a lot of people from the neighborhood did get jobs, no? I don't know. That's the thing, the rationale. Listen, I'm with you, <laughs> but I don't want to. We could, we could go in a whole I have drive. another question. <laughs> yes. Bedford, is it Bedford Street or Bedford Avenue in Brooklyn? Bedford Avenue. That, that seemed to me to be a stretch that I always loved to drive, or my husband loved it, because you went from one neighborhood to another, and you could almost see the line. Oh, absolutely. Change. You can see. And even sometimes within the... Uh, 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 the, the changes. There's some grand remnants of the 19th century. There's a magnificent Union League Club that's no longer a yeah. Union League Club there on Bedford Avenue. As you travel uh, along Bedford Avenue closer to Eastern Parkway, you've got the whole world of Eastern Parkway. You're near the, uh, the, the, the International Center of the Lubavitch Movement. You travel through <coughs> as you go through through neighborhoods such as Clinton Hill on mm -hmm. the way toward Williamsburg. And then when you go through Bedford Avenue through Satmar Williamsburg, yeah. where the Satmar Jews live, which I think is sort of interesting. Sat Satmar comes from Satumaru, which is, means St. Mary. It's the only Jewish group I know named for a, <laughs> for a Christian saint. But um, um, the, uh, the Satmar world then crosses over into what is arguably the oldest Puerto Rican community in the United States, um, and then into Hip Williamsburg, yeah, it's which so, is it's so which interesting. Total, and you can do that within a matter of minutes. You just you you you've crossed all of these different worlds. Don't you love being in the neighborhoods with the observant Jews, um, especially on on the Sabbath, where the men are all walking to their different destinations. Oh, absolutely. And, the and there's, there's a, a hush in that neighborhood, there's a isn't hush. there? There's a, it's a, sense, a different feeling. Sort of, uh, you know, the day is meant to be separate from all other days of the week, and you really get, you sense that quietude, that sense of of, uh, of uh, specialness of the day, and it's sacred, and it's special, and they're not exclusive, but they're on, on the end a little bit. Yeah. But um, you'll get a similar sensation in sections of Washington Heights, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, the, Old section. The, the section that is the more orthodox section of Washington Heights, which I think is interesting because of the Arab that runs the little boundary line. Yes, don't you love those Arabs? I think they're marvelous. I, I was 
Most people don't know they're there, do, do they? No, most people don't know them, but my favorite thing is sort of the, <laughs> the fusion between, you know, antiquity and contemporary things. That Arif has its own website. Oh, really? And I think, isn't it? Isn't now, an Arif is, is a, usually now in our country a wire that you really don't it's, see. It's a wire or it's a boundary line that defines the area yeah. of the uh, servants. Way that just, you can do certain things on the yeah. Sabbath that you. It sort of extends the prerogatives right. of your home. We're, we're almost at the end of the program. So how do people find out about your, got, your tours? Um, I have a website. Um, and what is it? www.justinsnewyork.com. That's J-U-S-T-I-N-S-N-E-W-Y-O-R-K.com. Um, I do a tour of Midtown and Grand Central Terminal every Friday. Uh, at 12.30, it is available at no charge, no reservations are required, and I do that with another tour guide named Peter Laskowitz. And where do you meet, at the information? You meet in the, at 120 Park Avenue, which is on the southwest corner of Park Avenue and 42nd Street, and um, it's... Oh, uh, it's, as the si it's the side that goes next to the elevated right next to the yeah. elevated across the street from Grand Central. The clue Where is... Where Philip Morris used to be. Exactly. And <laughs> the clue is there's a big atrium space inside uh -huh. with chairs and benches and tables, and that's where you sit yeah. if you arrive early. Uh, the groups tend to be large, which is why we have two tour guides, and the uh, focus is the neighborhood and Grand Central, and the tours change from week to week. You told me that one of your biggest disappointments is that you moved here after Penn Station was demolished. Oh, absolutely. Pennsylvania Station, it deserves that full Pennsylvania title. Station was one of my recent favorite things was in Grand Central uh, at the Transit Museum. They had a wonderful, large photograph of Pennsylvania uh, Station, and I would walk the group up because it was almost as if you were walking <laughs> into it. Yeah. Into I was lucky enough to be there. Um, are you listed also in the weekend of the times where things to do? Occasionally, but Occasionally. not that common. The best thing to do is to look at my website. I also have an email list that if people choose to, they can sign up for my email list. And what that does is not only my activities, but I also uh, send out information about things that I think people who are of like mind with me might enjoy. Well, today. we've come to the end of our program, and I'm so sorry because your, your curiosity is, is just such a, an armful of good things to talk about. And, uh, I hope that you'll come back again, and thank you very much, Justin. Oh, it's my pleasure, I assure Thank you. you. <laughs>